let's get into the Word this morning. This morning, uh, we're in week number three of the series, Soul Detox. And um, so far, we talked about in week one of this series, we talked about um, the busyness epidemic and how we can suffer from something that we call hurry sickness. And that is when we are either so busy that we can't find a way to press pause or because of the pace of modern life that the the just social media and access to entertainment and, and all of those things and not to mention work and all the things that we have to do that we can feel busy even if we're not like if we put it on a calendar um, I do this sometimes like I look down at the end of the day and I'm like I had zero appointments today and I was felt like I was busier than I've been ever, and I don't feel like I actually got anything done. Anybody feel like that sometimes where you're like, you get to the end of the day and you're like, I don't know what I did all day long, but I know I was busy, <laughs> and I can't even, if you ask me to tell you what I did, I probably couldn't tell you. And so we talked about how um, we need to be aware of that, and um, we started a 21-day Bible reading program, so we're 14 days into that today it was John 14. So if you want to read with us for the rest of the month, tomorrow morning will be John 15 through 21 this week, and we'll wrap that up. And if you want to get on that list where I'll I'll literally will text you every morning to let you know, um, our phone number that we text you from, the 817-500-0175, you can just text back the word Bible to that number, and you'll get those messages every morning. Um, And you can literally just click on the link and then hit play and then listen to the word. That's how I do it. Um, I like put it on like when I'm making coffee in the morning and listen to the, listen to the word in the morning. So, and then last week we talked about the Sabbath solution and that is um, that rest is actually something that we receive from Jesus and that the Sabbath was provided for us because God knows that we need to slow down and it's like a governor on our lives, like a governor on a vehicle that won't let you go too fast. That's Jeff's favorite thing to have on his truck as a governor. Um, <laughs> And, but um, a Sabbath makes us slow down because we can't run seven days a week. And I can tell you after this week, I'm ready for a day off. So if you call me tomorrow, I'll be in the swimming pool. Um, <laughs> and I'll call you back later. Um, all right. So uh, today we're going we're gonna to continue the series. And I, I want to start by reading a passage. And if we're If we're walking with Jesus, I want you to look what the Bible says the Holy Spirit will produce in our lives. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 says, The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the one we don't like. that the the Holy Spirit actually gives us the ability to control ourselves. You know, most sin is fun. People who say it's not haven't lived, but (laughs) sin is fun. That's why it's tempting. But the Holy Spirit gives us self-control. And we've talked about how we need a soul detox because we've filled our lives with busyness and stuff. And in in a series we did earlier this year, um, called Everything is Spiritual, I talked about, uh, there's a, a quote from um, the, I think the second century, um, I forget the, the philosopher's name, um, but he, he talks about bread and circuses, that, that all we need to do, that all they needed to do, that the Roman Empire had been consumed with bread and circuses and they had lost their depth, they had lost their ability to think critically and to function as productive members of society because they had been entertained and fed well. And then we talked about how if you just went and drove down the highway, what do you see? A whole bunch of places where you can go eat and be entertained. And so we suffer from that same condition today that we're satiated. That means that we're full, but we're actually starving to death because we're not filling ourselves with things that actually can produce life. And so one of the ways that we can detox the negative in our souls is by cultivating something good in our lives. And so the title of the message today is Cultivating Spiritual Fruit. 
Let me pray, and we'll get into it this morning. Lord, help us grow and bear good fruit. Amen. So this morning, I want to look at what it means to cultivate something, and then I want to give us some uh, hopefully practical steps that we can take to cultivate the fruit that we want to cultivate in our lives. Um, who knows, if, if you don't cultivate something in your garden, that doesn't mean nothing's going to grow. <laughs> that means stuff you don't want is going to grow if you don't actively cultivate the ground. So this, uh, this morning, we got, I got three points for you. The first point is this, the soil needs to be prepared. So if you look up the word cultivate in the dictionary, you know, I always thought, and I didn't even think when I titled the message this, I assumed that this is what it meant, but I was wrong. I just thought it meant to grow stuff. That's actually not the definition of the word cultivate. The, def- the definition of the word cultivate is to prepare or to prepare and use for the, prepare- for the raising of crops. And so cultivating actually has more to do with the soil than it does with the actual growing of the crops. It has to do with preparing the ground so that you can grow what you want to grow in the ground. You see, cultivating is not just planting seeds, watering, and harvesting. There's work that needs to be done before we can even plant the seeds. You know, I'm not a gardener, but, but I know that if we want to grow something, that the soil is, is very important. You see, we want the fruit, but are we willing to do the work that's necessary to cultivate that fruit? If you think about fertilizer, when you put down fertilizer, it's actually not, when you put fertilizer down, like you put fertilizer in your grass if, or, or in your garden, wherever you're doing that, when you put fertilizer down, uh, the plants don't actually just use the fertilizer. The fertilizer actually imparts nutrients into the soil and it enriches the soil. And then from the soil, the plants can draw what they need out of the soil. And so it adds phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium, I think, um, typically is the, the, three, the three numbers on a, on a bag of fertilizer. And so you can actually test your soil and you can find out what does my, what is, what's wrong with the soil in my yard. And then you can add the nutrients that it needs so that the thing that you want to grow can grow healthily. Uh, I want to look at what, what Jesus said about this in Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 through 8, and then we'll jump down and read. He's going to explain what he means. Um, so he says, he says, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds, and as he scattered them across the field, so there's four, there's four scenarios he's going to describe here. He says, the first one is, some seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Number two, other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted, but because the soil was shallow, um, I read that wrong, I think, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Uh, The third one, other seeds fell among thorns, so the soil was good, but there were a lot of thorns, and and, uh, choked out the tender plants as they started to grow. And then verse 8, still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as has been planted. Does anybody want to reap a harvest that's 30, 60, or 100 times what you plant? Like that, I, I do. And so if you read this story in the Bible, then um, they ask Jesus, they're like, why are you talking riddles? Like, why can't you just tell us what you mean? <laughs> Like, we're trying to follow along, but you're talking about seed falling on the ground, and we don't understand. And that's when he says, I've used the, the foolish things to confound the wise. He says, I've, you know, I've, I've, literally, I'm saying this so that it'll, you have to think about it to understand it. And so then they say, well, can you just explain this to us? And he says, all right. So in verse 18, he explains it to them, and he says, now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents the kingdom, uh, that represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. That's ignorance. They don't, they don't understand it. Ignorance isn't a bad word. It just means you don't know. If you call someone ignorant, maybe that's bad, but the word ignorance itself is not bad. Uh, th- then the evil one comes and snatches away that w- the seed that was planted in their hearts. 
The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. So this is somebody that's, that's unstable, that they hear the message and they're like, oh, that's awesome. And then five minutes later, they're like, forgotten all about it. So as they fall away, as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing in the word. So they get real excited when they come to church, but as soon as they leave and someone cuts them off in traffic, they're hanging double number ones out the window at somebody. <laughs> trying to personalize it a little bit for us. I know that's none of you, but <laughs> verse 22, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but are all too quick but all, I'm having a rough time reading words this morning, y'all. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no, fr- no fruit is produced. So this is, this is somebody who hears the word, and it goes in, and the soil is actually pretty good. But because of circumstances or temptation that's in front of us, that chokes out what the Lord wants to do in our lives. And then verse 23, the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much has been planted. And so there's four responses to the word, to Jesus. John chapter 1, if you've been reading the Bible with us, is in the beginning was the word and the word was God. Jesus was with God in the beginning and all things that have been made were made through him. Nothing that was made wasn't made through him. That's John chapter 1. But there's four responses when we hear the word. The first is ignorance. That's when we allow the enemy to steal the seed before it takes root because we don't know any better. Um, There's, I would say, impulsivity. And impulsivity are those who quickly accept and then quickly abandon. Right? So we're we're quick to be like, that's awesome. I'm going to do it. And then we wake up on Monday morning and just completely forget about it. Like, I got more important things to do. Uh, Number three, interference, I would say. So these are people who hear the message, but worry of the future or fear or the lure of temptation or wealth um, distract us. And because we're distracted, we don't do what the Lord has told us to do. And the fourth response is, I would say, investment. And, and those are people who hear, understand, do the work, and apply the message. And the Bible says that there's a reward for those who do that. And so I kind of came up with a little, a little catchy thing here. So ignorance leads to indifference. Impulsivity leads to instability. Interference leads to interruption. And investment leads to increase. And so indifference means we don't care. And so the, the soil that is that's just snatched off the footpath, those are, the, when, when we're ignorant, just think about it. If you don't know about something, like pick a topic, like there, I don't know, like my wife doesn't really care about like NFL football. And so she cares nothing about Dak's contract negotiations right now. And some of y'all don't know what an MVP candidate quarterback looks like, and that's okay, I'll pray for you later. Um, (laughs) impulsivity leads to instability. Um, That means when situations come, we get rocked. We just think about having a firm foundation this morning, that when the, when the waves come, that we won't be, we won't be rocked. It's in Matthew seven, if you want to read that parable. Um, Interference leads to the interruption of God's plan. Um, That means that we've got shiny object syndrome, that means that when we're at church and like, oh, that sounds awesome, I want to do that. And then the minute we get outside and the squirrel runs by, we're just like, oh, yeah, I want to do that. You know what I mean? That's, so it leads to um, interruptions can distract us from what God wants to do in our lives. And investment leads to increase, that, that if we do the work to prepare our heart, that those are the conditions of, of the soil. Our, our heart is the soil. And if we do the work to prepare our heart to receive the word, then those are conditions that God can work with. And so I'm, I'm not talking, when I use the word investment, I'm not talking about money here, although good stewardship principles follow this same process. If you want to do well financially, you need a strong foundation, um, and then you can build off of that. All right. 
Uh, so I want to tell you a story. I, I kind of tell on myself a little bit. This has been a long time, so I don't mind telling on myself a little bit. But we have a couple of college students that, that come to church here. And um, if you go to college or if you've been to college, um, you know that when they give you a syllabus, that's like a contract. That if, if you get a syllabus and, um, and you have a test and you can actually use what's in the syllabus and say, no, 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 this test was supposed to be 20% of my grade. And it says on the syllabus that the test was on you know, September 27th. You can't change it to the 26th because you put it in the syllabus. It's literally a binding document when they give you the syllabus, everything that's in it. And it's really important that you read it. (laughs) And so what they do a lot of times is the first day of class, the professor will literally read you the entire syllabus and say, do you have any questions? Uh, And then as I I started college a long time ago, um, so they, they do this, I think, all the time now, but they didn't used to do this, but... Um, about halfway through my master's degree, they started making us sign syllabus acknowledgement like papers that say, I have read and understand the syllabus. And now they pretty much do that everywhere. When you go to your first day of class, they read the syllabus to you and they make you sign something that says, I've read and I understand this. And once you sign that, that's your side of the agreement saying that I'm, I'm good with what you're putting down. And so when I was a freshman, or maybe a sophomore at A&M, I went to, uh, I had a, a business calculus class. And I showed up on the first day of class, and the teacher was like, here's all the things we're going to cover. We're going to cover, you know, yada, 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 yada. Well, I had just taken engineering calculus in high school because I thought I was going to do a, a degree path that needed engineering calculus. And when I changed my major that engineering calculus didn't work anymore. And I was like, well, I already know all this stuff. I'll see you on test day, ma'am. And so I left that class and I was like, this is going to be a breeze. I got it. And so I showed up on test day like a month later. Even like, I didn't even study until the night before. Like I pulled out my textbook and I was like, oh yeah, these formulas, they all look familiar. I know how to type this in my calculator. I'm good to go. Well, I show up on test day and I sit down and I take my test and there's no formulas on the page. And I was like, what in the world? What, what is this? Well, that's when I learned that the difference between engineering calculus and business calculus is engineering calculus, you're just solving the equations. <laughs> in business calculus, they, you're sol- they give you a word problem and then you have to decide what formula you want to use and then plug in all the things to it. And so Buster scored a 34 (laughs) on that test. And when I handed in the test, she said, hey, can you hang back for just a minute while everybody else finishes? I need to talk to you before you leave. And I was like, yeah, no problem. And I stuck back and she said, hey, did you you by chance read the syllabus? And I said, I think so. (laughs) And she said, well... There's a weekly quiz every week <laughs> that you're supposed to log in to your on. This is before like online school was a thing, but we had a portal. And this was like the first, I'd never even heard of taking a quiz online at this point. And she said, you actually log into your portal online and you have to take this quiz every week. And she said, and you're at a point right now in this class that as long as you made an A on the test today, you can still pass this class. But if, but if you did, yeah, did not make an A on that test. <laughs> and she said, no, it was 34 out of 100. <laughs> and she said, she goes, but if you didn't make an A on this test, there's like mathematically no way you can even pass this class now. You can't, like you'll make an F, you won't even make a D. And I said, well, I'll see you next semester. <laughs> You don't even need to grade it. I don't even need to know. You see, I thought I had a good foundation. I could solve the equations. But sometimes we do that in our lives. We jump to the end and and, and we say, you know, I I want the promise. I want the thing. I I want to get where I'm going. 
Um, I want to see the fruit and experience the growth. But we forget that we have to do some work on the foundation before we can get there. And without preparation, the seed won't grow and then we won't see the harvest that we want to see. We just planted uh, some flowers in our little uh, flower bed a couple weeks ago and then forgot to water them. It was Dorothy planted them. There's like two seeds. And they never grew because we didn't, we didn't water them to take care of them. <laughs> but many of our problems can be solved or mitigated by simply getting in the Word. That's how, that's how we prepare our foundation. Uh, the Bible says, and this isn't going to be on the screens, but in Genesis 2-7, the Bible says that God breathed life into man. And then in 2 Timothy 3-16, the Bible says that every word is theonustos. That means God breathed. And so uh, one of my pastors a long time ago said every morning it's like, <sighs> like this, is where, this is where the breath of life comes from. And so breathe in some life and take in the nutrients that your heart needs so that you can cultivate the fruit that you want to cultivate. Point number two, be patient in the process. I don't know about you, I am not a patient person. (laughs) Sometimes I fool myself into thinking I'm patient and then I'm not. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, Dear brothers and sisters, when when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it pure... I think I copied... Hang on. No, it's right. I'm telling you all, words are hard today. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to read from back here because it's better. All right. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. I think I was quoting out of the NIV over here, but we have it in the NLT up here. Uh, So the point is, growth doesn't happen by chance. At least not when you're growing what you want to grow. Uh, One time... Um, I think it was when I, when I graduated with my MDiv, I had, I had an employee that I worked with, um, and she bought me an orchid. And I said, that is awesome. You just bought yourself an orchid to take care of at my desk. Because <laughs> I'm a professional at killing plants, particularly orchids. I don't have the patience to take care of an orchid. They're beautiful. It, it looked awesome on my desk for years. But I don't have the patience that's required to grow an orchid. And so she did. Every day she came in and she would like spritz it with the thing and like trim off, I don't know, do all the things. And that, it was beautiful. It was on my desk for several years. You see, when we endure challenges, that's when we grow. I was, I was talking to Nathan yesterday, uh, or maybe, I don't know, sometime this week, I think it was yesterday. Um, and he, he, if y'all don't know, he, that, he loves spicy food. Like, real, like, real spicy. Like, set your mouth on fire spicy. Like, ghost peppers are the beginning of his spiciness. There he is right there. <laughs> speak, speak of Nathan, and he walks in the room. And so he was telling me yesterday, because like if I eat a ghost pepper, I'm going to cry. <laughs> like I won't, I won't want to, like I want to be strong, like, but I can't, it just happens. That thing is hot. And, and Nathan, so he goes, well, after you get used to eating ghost peppers, he said, jalapenos taste like pickles. <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's not me. But you, you see, that, that same principle is true in, in, our, in our lives, when you're an adult, you look at the problems that teenagers face and you say, well, that's just, that's just stupid. You're going to get over it. It's not that big of a deal. Well, it is to the teenager. You see, relationships and social interactions are new for them. 
Now, if you're an adult still having teenager problems, that's silly. We were on a, we were on a cruise uh, a couple months ago, and these two grown men, like mid-40s, got into a fist fight on the serenity deck of all places. That's the deck where only adults are allowed to go. You have to be at least 21 to go up there, and it's supposed to be peaceful and quiet. And there was a literal fist fight between these two guys because he, one guy thought, another, he was like inebriated, and he thought another guy had like looked at his wife. And so like they literally were like, like fist fight. So if you don't know, um, they do have a jail on cruise ships. <laughs> And what happens is if you get arrested and you're like on the way to like Jamaica, like they arrest you, take you down to the cruise ship jail, but you don't stay there until you get back to Galveston. They take you off and give you to the police in whatever port you're going to. And then you get to stay there and figure out how to get home. So don't be a dummy on a cruise ship. Um, But they were fighting. It was, that was teenager stuff they were fighting over. Like, who cares? Like, just move on. Like, get over it. But we have to be patient as we grow. That's the point here, that, that as, as, as we go through things and we learn and we stretch and we face new challenges, those things produce growth in us. And I want to look at a story in the Bible um, that I think illustrates that really well with um, King David. So in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, this is when David gets anointed to be king. The Bible says that as David stood there among his brothers... Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. Uh, and in biblical times, when you were anointed, like you're marked to be the king. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. And then, I love it, and the Bible's like, then Samuel took off. He came in, anoints David as king, and then he just leaves. And so then, like, David becomes king, right? Well, Saul is still king at this time. Saul is um, still on the thrones. And, and the Bible says the Lord had tried to reason with Saul, and Saul wasn't having it. And so the Bible says that the Lord withdrew the anointing from Saul and said, you're, I, I'm taking my hand off of you, and, like, you're, you're, like someone's going to supplant you, so get ready for it. So then we see this whole thing, but... David gets anointed king, and then um, Saul starts having these nightmares, and he is looking for someone to come play the harp, because when when someone would play worship music for him, that would cause the evil spirit to leave. And so look what the Bible says. It says, so Saul sent messengers to Jesse, that's David's dad, and says, send me your son David, the shepherd. Not send me your son David, the king. Well, but I thought he was anointed to be king. You see, the word anointed just means to be set aside for a purpose. And so you can be anointed, but not yet appointed. Because growth takes time. Uh, The Lord first called me into ministry when I was in middle school. I'm 38, so if, or no, almost 38, a couple months, 37 now. <laughs> I, thought for, I thought I was in real good remembering 37. Once you hit like 34, I've learned that you just forget what the number is and say it wrong. <laughs> I can't ever, I'm th- 37, almost 38. Um, but then like in high school, in the first couple of years of college, I was, you know, a crazy person. And, and then the Lord called me for real to ministry in 2009. That's when I started going to Bible college. I transferred from um, A&M to Liberty University and um, lost most of my credits because um, rangeland ecology and management credits don't count towards a Bible degree. And so I went from being a senior to being a sophomore. And then I finished up like two and a half years of school in three semesters and um, graduated. And then I did my MDiv. That took a long time, eight years. (laughs) get my MDiv. Um, But my boss would tell me, like, as I was getting my MDiv, and then when I finally graduated in 2019, 
he would tell me, he would say, Buster, you're the only project manager I know that's got an MDiv. He would also say, you're the only person I know with an MDiv that's not a pastor. And I would just, and, and I had several people, including some people that were um, on an elder board at a church I was a part of that would tell me all the time, like, well, you should just, you, you should be there preaching more. And my response was always the same, not until God says go. Like when God tells me to go, I'll go. But until he tells me to go, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, one of my pastors tells, uh, tells this, uh, this story, he says that if the Lord tells me to go east, I'm going east. And if I get to the East Coast and I haven't gotten a different word yet to tell me to go a different direction, I'm finding a plane or a boat or a pool floaty or something, and I'm going East until the Lord tells me to change direction. And so I have a question for you. What is the last thing God told you to do? And have you done it? Or are you doing it? You see, we have to be patient in the process because authority requires maturity. And in my opinion, there's almost nothing more dangerous than an immature leader. It may or may not be your fault if you're immature, but there is something you can do about it. And it takes time, but over time, you'll look back and you'll realize that you've grown more than you thought you would. If you think about, uh, we, we had a pecan tree in, in our front yard growing up, and we actually planted it when I was a kid. And um, when I was maybe seven or eight years old, that tree was like five feet tall. And the, the stalk of the tree was about as big as my pinky finger is. It was, just, it was like a, just a stem sticking up. There were no branches. What would happen to that tree if it tried to carry the same amount of pecans as the now 35-foot tall tree? It would just snap and break. You see, good fruit is good, but if you have good fruit before it's time to have good fruit, it'll break you. Point number three, God prunes us for growth. The Bible says in John chapter 15, verse 1 through 5, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I am the true grapevine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit of if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, this is in case you didn't get it yet. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh, it's not fun work, but the work of pruning is one of the most important jobs of a gardener. Uh, so I, I looked it up, and there's, there's eight things, maybe more, but there's at least eight things that pruning does. Number one is it's, it provides health maintenance. So pruning helps remove dead, diseased, and damaged branches that are, uh, it prevents the, the spread of disease and pests and encourages the plant to direct energy towards healthy growth. There's some wisdom in that. You don't want to, you don't want to invest your energy into things that are bad for you. Uh, number two, it can stimulate growth. They can stimulate the plant to produce new growth, and it can also um, and, and can cause the plant to grow more flowers or more fruit, depending on what the, what the plant or tree is. Uh, pruning, is, it helps the shape and the structure of a plant. Uh, it allows the gardener, in this case God, to control the plant's size and form. 
we're told to be conformed into his image. That's how this happens, that we let God prune us and shape us into the way that he wants us to look. And it ensures that a plant grows in a desirable direction or shape. It reduces the risk of sickness. I'm not necessarily talking about physical sickness, but that can apply. But um, thinning out dense areas of growth allows more sunlight and air to reach the inner parts of the plant, which reduces the risk of fungal diseases and promotes better overall health. Uh, Number five, it it removes unwanted or unneeded branches. Unnecessary um, branches divert energy from the main plant and can lead to a weaker structure. Uh, My neighbor has got a dying pecan tree that hangs over my house. And so I had to pay a whole bunch of money a couple years ago to get an arborist to come out and clean all the dead branches off the top of my house because I don't want those things falling on my house. They can fall in his yard all they want. (laughs) It can increase uh, fruit production. We talked about this already, that it can increase the quantity and quality of the flowers or fruit by focusing the plant's energy on, on the good structures. Um, it provides safety and accessibility. Uh, it removes branches that are going too cro- close to structures, power lines, or walkways. Did y'all know that Encore has a team that runs around and trims tree branches away from power lines? Because if you're not careful, a tree branch can fall and knock out power for a whole neighborhood. At least if you live in an old neighborhood like I do, where we still have power lines that aren't buried below ground. But that's why that's all below ground nowadays in new, in new, uh, new subdivisions. And number eight, it can encourage a strong structure. So especially for young trees, pruning helps develop a strong structure with branches that are spaced appropriately so that it can support the fruit that it's going to bear. And it can prevent future damage from the wind or the weight of fruit or snow or wind or things like that. Like I said a minute ago, if you, if you try to bear fruit that you're not prepared to bear, it will break you. We trimmed, we trimmed the, some of the trees, the, the branches on that pecan tree, because this tree that my neighbor has is probably 40 or 45 feet tall, maybe 50 and some of the branches, the canopy should be at least 30 feet up in the, in the air for a tree of that size. But some of those branches would hang down. Like I could touch them when I walked by. Like they hang over our vehicles. And the weight of, of the fruit that's hanging on those branches causes them, particularly when it's getting about this time of year when, when the pecans are really growing, that those things really start to sag. And the weight of that, uh, simply the weight of the pecans growing on this tree can cause those branches to fall off. I have to grab those and then throw them over into his yard. You got to give them, it belonged to him. He needs to get them back. <laughs> and so when God prunes us, it removes dead things from our lives, stimulates spiritual growth, molds us to look more like Jesus, strengthens our spiritual immune system, removes the things that make us spiritually weak, increases the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, helps us not hurt other people or be hurt by them, and promotes a strong uh, structure or foundation so that we're not beat up by the pressure that comes from the fruit or by the waves and the wind and the things like that that come against us in our lives. Uh, you see, when I, when I talk about um, this often, I use this illustration of going on a hiking trip with Jesus. And, and I often, when I, when I tell this story, I, I say that it's like Jesus invites you to go on a hiking trip. And he says, the only, the only stipulation is you can't bring anything with you. I'm going to provide everything that you need. And so what do we do? We go home and we say, all right, let me find the biggest bag I've got. And we stuff all of our stuff into it. Well, it's like if, if you go on a vacation I'm, we're the, Ashley and I are the opposite. I'm the one with a big suitcase when we travel. I've got three sets of clothes for every day that I'm going to be. I've, I've just traveled before and been stuck like somewhere I didn't necessarily want to stay longer than I needed to. And so if that happens a few times, you start overpacking. 
And so we show up with all our big rucksack full of stuff and Jesus in his grace just says, all right, come on, let's go. He doesn't shame us, doesn't tell us like, no, I told you not to bring anything. He just says, all right, let's go. And we start walking and we're like, man, this is kind of heavy. Like, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I don't really know. I don't really know if I can make it up this, this hill carrying all this stuff. And so Jesus will say, hey, you know, if you just took out that thing that's weighing you down, you'd be able to make it a little further. He doesn't make us drop the whole bag. He just says, hey, take this, take this one thing out. You see, that's, that's kind of like what pruning is. And, and at our house growing up, we had crepe myrtles on the side. If you've ever seen a crepe myrtle, they can either be one of the most beautiful plants or one of the most hideous plants. And my dad, every year, would prune these plants every when, in, over the wintertime. He would prune them down. You see, what happens in a crepe myrtle is they get new shoots that come up from the base every year. And if you don't trim those down, they'll grow eventually into big stalks. And then you get this big, unmanageable thing that you can hardly... It just, it's just a mess. But if you do... There's almost nothing prettier than a crepe myrtle that's been taken care of. But they require pruning. So are you willing to let God prune you? Doesn't feel good. Doesn't feel good when you have to cut off things that don't belong in your life. So how do you know if something needs to be pruned? Is there anything in your life that if God asked you to quit doing it, you couldn't quit doing? That's a thing that needs to be pruned. And pruning is a consistent process. Every new season brings new things that need to be pruned. Just like those crepe myrtles, every single winter there would be new growth that we needed to prune. There were new branches that would start to grow out of the top that we needed to prune to keep the shape growing up and not out. We had three that were like in a 10 foot row. Like if you didn't trim them up, they would just like turn into a wall. And pruning can be painful, but that's how God shapes and molds us to look more like Jesus. So preparation, patience, and pruning. That's how you cultivate spiritual fruit. That's how you cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. If you want to be more like Jesus, our lives should look like Him. And if you want to cultivate love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, the way we do that is by preparing our heart for the Word being patient while the Lord works with us, not trying to get too fast, not trying to arrive at the destination when we're still at the starting line. And then allowing the Lord to prune us. They're having a real good time back there. They got a new room with... Yeah. So if we're lacking in any of those areas... We need to make sure that the conditions are right for cultivation. We need to prepare our hearts, the soil, to be prepared to receive the word. We need to be patient while Jesus leads us. And we need to be willing to be praying. He's not just going to come up and just lock your arm off without asking. Like the Lord, the Lord is, is slow and, and he's, it's his kindness that leads to repentance. And if we do that, naturally we will cultivate spiritual fruit and look more like Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes?